Good afternoon, everyone, watching us live online on Centra. Thanks for joining us this afternoon for our first online PD Plus session here at RIOS. My name's Lisa. I work here on the programs team. So today we're here with Professor Peter Langridge from the Australian Centre for Plant Functional Genomics. And he's going to be talking to us about food security. Uh, the people that have registered for this event should have received a teacher resource notes pack in the email this morning. Uh, that's also available to download from our website at www.rios.org.au. Uh, and that has a number of background resources and information for teachers on food security, some articles and classroom activities for you to work on. So the way that this session is going to work is that we're going to start with an introduction presentation from Peter, and that will go for about 10 to 15 minutes as a background briefing on food security. And then we're going to open it up to questions. So if at any point during the presentation you have a question, type it into the text box, and I'll be asking those questions on behalf of you, the audience, online. Um, so I think with that, we'll hand over now to Peter Langridge. Hello, everyone. Um, I should explain that one of the reasons why I'm sitting here talking to you about food security is that uh, last year I was involved in chairing an expert working group for the federal government on Australia and food security in the changing world. And part of our brief was really to try and consider what are the issues for Australia with respect to food security and should we really be worried about food security in this country? I think maybe the best way to begin is by uh, giving you a definition of food security and this definition is one that I've lifted from the, uh, from the FAO. You'll have to excuse me while I look down and read this, although uh, without my glasses it's a bit tricky. Basically, their definition was that food security is when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food to meet daily needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. That's a really important definition, and it's actually a fairly broad definition of food security. And there are five important components of that. The first of those is the issue of availability. Is food available? Is it available on a consistent basis? Is it accessible? So is it, are people able to, to get access to food? And if you think about it, even in a country like Australia, there are some communities that have difficulty in getting access to good quality food. Acceptability is also important. Does it meet uh, cultural requirements? As you know, many uh, cultural groups have specific requirements for the way in which their food is produced and prepared and for the type of food. So we need to uh, deal with that. Adequacy is the fourth component, and that really uh, is the issue about is the, is the food of sufficient quality? Does it have all the nutritional uh, requirements that people need for a, a healthy and active life? And then finally, stability. Is the supply stable? And here, you know, the, I the situation is fairly obvious. On average, there may be enough food available, but if uh, in uh, five year, one year out of ten uh, there's a major famine, uh, then that is a significant problem. So stability of supply is important. Okay, so Australia. Do we need to worry about food security in Australia? At the moment, we produce enough food for about 60 million people. That's uh, about 40 million more than we have at the moment in this country. So why should we worry? If you look at, uh, uh, but if you look at a lot of the, the food that we produce, for example, wheat, we account for only about 3% uh, of the total wheat that's produced globally. Nevertheless, we're the fourth biggest wheat exporter in the world. And internationally, we're regarded as being a stable supplier of food and producer of food. That may come as a bit of a surprise given the, the droughts and the floods we've had, but compared to what's been happening in other parts of the world, we are still a stable producer and supplier of food. Uh, beef would be another example. We're the, uh, um, the second largest uh, beef exporter in the world, but only the seventh largest beef producer. So again, we export a lot of beef from this country. So in that sort of scenario, do we really need to worry? Well, I'd say that there are three reasons why we need to be concerned. The first really relates to this issue of food availability. I think you've all seen that after the floods that we've had recently in Australia, after Cyclone Larry a few years ago, uh, there can be significant interruptions to supply of food in this country that can lead to big increases in prices. So the big increase in prices of bananas that we've seen recently and that we saw in the past. Uh, it was interesting that a few years ago the government did an analysis of what would happen if we had a major epidemic or a major catastrophe in Australia in terms of food supply. And it turns out that our supermarkets have only about four days food supply. So if we were to be hit by uh, an emergency, a catastrophe as has happened recently in Japan, uh, we would struggle to maintain efficient supply of food and high quality food to all of our supermarkets in this country. 
The other thing that relates to this is globally we've seen a huge volatility in food prices. There are a whole lot of reasons related to this, the, the diversion of grain to biofuels, uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, speculation in the grain markets, very low supplies and all the rest of it. But the last three or four years, there's been more variation in the price of uh, staple foods than there has in the previous 30 years. So it's record levels of instability and volatility in prices. And that can also affect us. The other thing is that uh, if you look at the, the situation that we've had in Australia in the recent past, in 2007, for example, at the, uh, when we were at the peak of the severe droughts, in Eastern Australia in particular, we produced about 9 million tonnes of wheat. We consume locally 7 million tonnes. Now imagine a population twice the current size. We would have actually been a net importer of wheat in that year because of those droughts. So we cannot take our current abundance of food for granted. Okay, so that's the first issue. Second issue is food in society and how society looks at food and considers food. Uh, the level of knowledge that we have in the community about food and it's where, where it's being produced and how it's produced is, is becoming increasingly sketchy. And a lot of decisions that people make about the food uh, and about what should happen in uh, uh, the agricultural community uh, are based upon either poor or misinformation. We also have a problem about the, uh, the personal decisions make about the food they eat, and, and you're all aware of the obesity uh, plague or epidemic that we have developing in this country, mainly based around poor, poor food choices, poor food decisions that people are making. One of my colleagues made a comment that he thinks that uh, our society has lost respect for food. And we see that not only in the poor choices we make about what we eat, but in the amount of waste. Uh, it's estimated that in Australia, uh, about 40% of the food that's bought is actually thrown out and not consumed. So that level of waste is clearly not sustainable over a long term. While our problem in the developed world is mainly that we waste food after we buy it because it's so cheap, so readily available, in the developing world, food is lost or wasted because of uh, very poor infrastructure for storing food and for transport of food. And uh, in many countries, it can be in excess of 50% of the food that's actually being produced never ends up being consumed because it's lost somewhere along the, along the way. Okay, so there's this big issue about uh, how we treat food and what we know about food and how we make decisions about food. And the third point is one more of um, global responsibility. Uh, there's a quote I'd like to read you from Josette Sheeran, who was the, uh, the executive director of the uh, FAO uh, World Food Program. And she made this comment, a hungry world is a dangerous world. Without food, people have only three options. They, they riot, they emigrate, or they die. None of these options are acceptable. So the point here is we have a rising global population. We're at about uh, six and a half billion people at the moment. The predictions are that by 2050, we will be about 9.2 billion. The predictions, encouragingly, are also that the global population will probably stabilise at about 9.5 billion. Uh, but nevertheless, that means we need to produce food for another 2.5 billion people uh, within the next 40 years. And that is a really big ask. Uh, it means we have to increase productivity dramatically over the current level. In fact, we have to increase productivity by about 50% above the current levels. And we need to do that in an environment where we're facing the, uh, the difficulty of climate change, which is causing considerable instability in production systems, and where there's a demand by society to reduce the amount of inputs into agriculture. Cost of fertilizers, for example, are rising dramatically, cost of fuel, all of these sorts of things. Okay, so the situation is, is really on the surface fairly serious. Uh, and I'll just go through those points again. There are three main re reasons why I believe it's important that we worry about food security in this country. The first is this issue of food supplies and stability of supplies. The second is that we have a community that is largely fairly ill-informed about food and are making poor choices. And I'm generalizing here, of course, but many in our community are making very poor choices about their food. And thirdly, there is a question of regional stability. If we have uh, our major famines in our region, it causes major problems for countries such as Australia. If you think we have a uh, problem with boat people at the moment, imagine a scenario where there are major uh, uh, famines in parts of Southeast Asia. Okay, so that's the issue, and that's the problem, and the challenges that we need to face. 
So what can we do about it? What are the options to actually try and address this? Well, firstly, I think we need to recognize the importance of the food industry and food for this country. Um, the, the total value of the food industry is about $240 billion annually. About half of that is food retail, about four, 40 billion or so is from uh, food production. It is a huge industry. It's a very important industry for this country. It employs over 200,000 people. Uh, it's also a very sophisticated industry. Again, in Australia, we have probably one of the most urbanized societies in the world now. And uh, we have uh, people who are living in cities who've become quite remote, I think, from agricultural production and from food processing. And they forget just how far we've come in the way in which we produce food and manage our farms. It's now a highly sophisticated, highly scientific industry. The, uh, um, the FAO made an estimate that if we're going to meet the demands for food uh, consumption or for the growing world population, most of that increase is going to have to come from making better use of the land we have available at the moment. There isn't very much more land that we can bring into farming. And in fact, in some parts of the world, land is coming out of farming because due to expansion of deserts and things like that. And uh, clear felling rainforest is not a good option in trying to produce more food. So we need to make better use of the land we have available at the moment. We also need to make better use of the resources we have. The key resource, of course, for food production is water. Uh, and uh, I think we're all aware of the issues, even in a sophisticated country like Australia, in managing uh, water and irrigation systems and making decisions about how to balance the requirements for food production with the requirements for the environment. So that's fairly important. We also need to be very much more careful about how we utilize fertilizers. You know, nitrogen fertilizer has been uh, very cheap, uh, very widely used uh, by farmers around the world. It was cheap because it was generated from natural gas. Natural gas is becoming expensive. Nitrogen runoff is becoming an issue. But the important thing here is it was never really an objective for farming systems and for plant breeders to try and tackle the problem about how efficiently we utilize nitrogen and phosphorus and other nutrients. So there is actually a significant opportunity to improve breeding. In fact, the FAO believe that if we're going to meet this challenge of feeding uh, over 9 billion people, we're going to achieve that largely by improving the yield of our current crops and improving the way in which we manage resources. And this involves bringing in a whole range of different technologies and capabilities. Uh, I'm, my own interests are in plant genetics and plant breeding, and that obviously will be important. But a lot of things uh, can also be done with respect to the utilization of resources. There are a lot of significant engineering problems related to improving uh, our water use, and water use efficiency. What I find really exciting now is the, the use of satellite imagery to, to look at the way in which farms are being managed. I can actually use that in my sort of work for plant breeding. We can get data and information on how crops are performing in different parts of the world, different environments, by using satellite images. I've just uh, uh, got back from, uh, from looking at a, we've been talking with uh, a company that's based in, uh, in Adelaide that do uh, infrared imaging of crops. And we want them to fly over our field trials and do imaging of the temperature of the crops. And we can use that to work out how efficiently the crops are utilizing water. If they're cool, they're transpiring more water, and we can use that as a trait for looking for plants that are getting their roots deeper down into the soil and finding more water. So there's some beautiful technologies that are coming through. There's a huge amount we can do. We haven't been faced with this problem before. We've been able to just continue utilizing the resources. There was plenty of water from irrigation systems. There was plenty of fertilizer. We need to change that way of thinking, and we need to focus in on how we can utilize some of these new technologies. So that's the overview that I wanted to give you. And I think we can now move on to, to questions. Okay, well, I might start with the first question. Um, how important do you think genetic engineering is going to be as part of this solution to increasing food production and food yield? Yeah, that's uh, a good question, and it's a question that always comes up with respect to food security. Uh, personally, I believe that genetic engineering will be a component of the solution. It's uh, essentially part of a continuum of technological advance that we've seen in plant breeding going back, uh, well, uh, about 100 years or so when really uh, science started playing a key role. It's, uh, uh, it's been a very effective technology. Where it's available to farmers, it's had a, a significant impact in reducing uh, costs and improving productivity. Uh, and also, it uh, uh, can be highly beneficial to the environment because it can reduce the demand for pesticides. So it definitely has a role to play, but it's not a silver bullet. It's going to be a component of a whole list of things that will need to be done. 
Okay, and another question relating to climate change and how climate change might impact food production, particularly in Australia. The predictions and the models that have been done for climate change in Australia are quite complicated. Uh, we are fortunate in Australia that we have within CSRO an extremely good uh, research program that have been doing a lot of modelling about this. Uh, overall, the estimates are that uh, agricultural productivity in Australia will drop from 20, between 20 and 30 per cent from current levels. So it'll have a big impact. Uh, one of the difficulties is it's hard to know just how bad climate change will be. So if you take about a 2% uh, you know, rise in temperature, globally that actually would be beneficial for agriculture. If it's a bit warmer, plants grow faster. The extra CO2 actually accelerates uh, carbon fixation, so plants also grow faster. The problem is if you go much above 2 degrees, things start going pear-shaped for you very quickly. Uh, and uh, you know, now that the, the models are starting to firm up a bit more, it looks like 4 or 5 degrees is more likely to be the scenario in um, 30 years from now. And that is actually fairly bad. And that's this 20 to 30 percent decline in productivity in Australia. The other big issue with climate change, of course, is the climate variability, these huge swings that we're seeing in, uh, um, in seasons, from floods to droughts. Uh, so that also is an interesting shift. And it means we need to change a lot of our strategies to build far more resilient production systems, both in terms of the varieties that we breed, but in the way in which we manage our farms. Okay, and I've got a couple of questions here com coming from John Agnew. Um, and he asks, I've heard it said that much of the reason for people starving is that they cannot afford food, yet part of what you mentioned was that food is too cheap. Could you please comment on this? I didn't say that food was too cheap. Uh, in uh, the developed world, food is relatively cheap. Uh, we spend probably only about 10% of our disposable income on food in countries like Australia, which is very little, I think. Uh, given how important food is to us. Uh, and people will make, uh, uh, go to a greater effort deciding on what television they'll buy than in deciding what food they might buy. Uh, now, and that's in stark contrast to, to many parts of the world where people are spending their entire income on food. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, there has been so much instability in many parts of the world recently has been related to the impact that the rising food prices has had, particularly on the middle class. So if you're, as I said, in Australia, we're only spending about 10% of our income on food, but if you looked at the, look at the rising middle class in many of the developing countries, uh, they may be spending uh, between 30 and 40% of their income on food, uh, and that means they have significant disposable income for, for other uh, aspects of life that improve their quality of life. If food prices go up by uh, 20, 30, 50%, or even 100%, as they have in some countries, that, for these people, makes a dramatic change. Suddenly, they're spending their entire income on food, or close to their entire income on food, uh, and basically all of the advances that they believe that they've achieved over the previous few years have been lost. And that leads to substantial political instability. At the very poor end of the spectrum, uh, people basically start dying or emigrating to, to find food. So, you know, one can't generalise across the world. There's a huge difference in the scenario in the developed and the developing world. Uh, we have another question about peak phosphorus. Um, how big a problem is this and what are the possible solutions? I might ask if you could just um, briefly describe what, they, what the term peak phosphorus means. Okay, yeah, phosphorus is, a, is an essential nutrient for, for all of life. Uh, plants need phosphorus. Countries like Australia, we have very phosphorus deficient soils. So we need to apply phosphorus in order to um, generate crops, to, for crops to survive, basically. Uh, in the past, we, uh, we got our phosphorus from mining uh, the uh, bird guano, the bird droppings, from Nauru. Uh, nowadays, the phosphorus that we use is coming from the Western Sahara, in particular, from Morocco and Algeria, and also from China, where the, the largest deposits of uh, rock phosphate are. These deposits have a, a, a limited life. They are a defined size, and they will be depleted over a period of time. The predictions are that if we keep utilising phosphorus at the current rates and keep growing the, uh, the level of phosphorus we're applying, that we will have reached uh, a peak of utilisation by about 2035, which is only 15 years away, and then the price will start rising dramatically and phosphorus utilisation will have to drop. In fact, if you actually look at what happened over the last uh, um, few years, the cost of phosphorus fertiliser has gone up spectacularly. And that's because the Chinese have imposed quite a hefty export tariff on rock phosphate from China. 
and the, uh, the rock phosphate that's coming from the Western Sahara, from the Atlas Mountains, that's an area where there's been uh, quite a lot of, uh, uh, should we say, political activity. There have been quite serious conflicts there between Morocco, Algeria and Mauritania. Uh, and the United Nations have actually uh, strongly discouraging countries from buying phosphorus from that area because it's been exacerbating the political problems. So if we run out of phosphorus, uh, we will see a significant decline in our yields. Um, that's important for countries like Australia. It's critical for countries like India, who are almost totally dependent upon imported phosphorus. Uh, so that's the reason why we're worried about it. But we haven't worried about it in the past. So I think there are a lot of things that, in a scientific sense, that we can use to try and address that. There's some quite nifty uh, genetic solutions. Uh, there are management solutions we can use. There's a lot we can do to get you know, uh, a hell of a lot more out of the phosphorus that we do apply. And we need to start using those things now. Um, there's a comment here. Uh, there'd be more food available if we were all vegetarians. Do you want to make a comment on that, that statement? Um, well, it's true. Uh, the uh, feed conversion rates, if you pump your food through uh, uh, an animal and then eat the animal, you lose a fair bit. The most efficient are probably chickens, where it's about, I think, two and a half fold conversion rate. So for two and a half kilos of food, you get about one kilo of chicken meat out. Uh, for uh, ruminants, cattle, sheep, goats, it's about five to one. Um, so yes, it's true. Uh, and in the developed world, in Europe and in North America, about 70% of the grain that's produced goes into animal feed. Uh, the question, though, is there are aspects of meat production that are, uh, you know, in terms of long-term sustainability, undesirable, like the situation in Europe and North America. Uh, but uh, in, in parts of uh, the developing world, uh, meat, particularly chickens, can be an important component of the diet. Um, you can survive on a vegetarian diet quite successfully, and many, many vegetarians do, but you need to have a good balanced diet. You need to have access to both cereals and to legumes. You need fresh fruit and vegetables. That's okay in a society like Australia where we can buy all those things. In many parts of the world, it's not so simple. There may only be cereals available, or there may only be fresh fruit and other uh, legumes available in certain times of the year. So you know, during winter, for example, you may be totally dependent upon uh, wheat or rice. In those scenarios, you will suffer from, uh, you can suffer from severe protein deficiency, and having a few chickens in the backyard can be actually quite important. The chickens and pigs can also feed on food scraps that otherwise, uh, you know, would be wasted. So, you know, it, it needs to be balanced. There, there's clearly a role for animal production in a number of poor societies. We've probably gone too far in the other extreme. We eat far too much meat far more than we need to and we should, and that is wasteful. Okay, I just wanted to add in another question. Um, for any teachers that are watching this and their students might be, you know, interested in or alarmed by or, you know, hearing about food security for the first time, um, if you're interested in trying to help solve these kinds of problems, what are some of the avenues, say, for further study that, that students could be looking at in, in order to help try and answer some of these big problems? Well, virtually every aspect of science has a role to play in, in the food security. If you're interested in engineering or physics, as I said, there's some fantastic new things that are occurring in terms of the way in which we manage water resources and the way in which we can uh, you know, develop predictive models and analyze the way crops are developing. Uh, in genetics, you know, my, my favorite area, there's a lot we can do in plant breeding. A lot of these uh, you know, targets for breeding now, like we were talking about fertilizer efficiency, we haven't worried about them in the past. So I think there's enormous opportunities for, for gain and uh, advances there. Um, there are some big issues related to nutrition. So if you're interested in the more medical side of things, uh, there's a lot that can be done in, uh, in looking at the way in which people eat food, consume food, improving diets, looking at the relationship between health, disease, and, uh, and nutrition. As I said, almost every area of science has a role to play in food and, and uh, is is being used to some extent, but we're desperately short of people. So if there's anybody out there who's interested in food, and let's face it, I think we're all interested in food, then uh, this is definitely a good career path. Thanks for that. And um, do you want to just tell us a little bit about the place that you work at, the Australian Centre for Plant Functional Genomics, and what does that mean and what does, what does your organisation try to do? Okay, yes, yeah, so firstly, I need to apologise for the name. The Australian Centre for Plant Functional Genomics is a real mouthful, uh, and most people don't know what functional genomics is. 
Uh, it's essentially really based around a, a changes that occurred in uh, genetic technologies. That we've moved to, actually quite a few years ago, we moved to a phase where we can start analyzing all of the genes that make up an organism and look at the way in which those genes are turned on or turned off and the way in which they respond particularly to environmental cues such as drought stress or pathogen attack, these sorts of things. And that meant for the first time we were able really to start at a fine level dissecting the way in which plants respond to stresses. In uh, uh, my center, we work on abiotic stress tolerance, so drought, salinity stress, and a whole lot of related stresses. And we use wheat and barley as, our, as our, the species that we work on. We pick those two species because they're the most important crops for Australia. Uh, but they're also, of the, the major cereals, they're the most uh, stress tolerant crops as well. So it was very interesting to try and deconvolute how they work and how they operate. So we're doing a lot of work on trying to work out the genetics of drought and salinity tolerance and looking at ways we can improve breeding for those traits. Okay, we have another question here. Do you see organic food with its lower yields playing a bigger or smaller role in the future? The organic industry is very hard to, to judge and really comment on to some extent because I think part of the difficulty we've had is that we've been very focused on a particular type of agricultural production and our research, uh, pretty well our entire focus has been on that system. And organic and a whole range of related technologies have not been uh, explored to a great extent. And certainly at the moment the organic industry has significant problems in uh, you know, getting even close to the production levels that we get from, uh, should we say, conventional agriculture. I think there are also some issues that the organic movement has got too fixed on, I suppose, ideology rather than some of the science that underpins uh, their, uh, their work and their efforts. So when the, when the organic movement first started, it was really focused very much on minimizing chemical inputs into agriculture. Uh, and I think most agriculture is now focused on minimizing chemical inputs, be it pesticides or fertilizers. Uh, but we haven't, and this really goes back to this issue, we haven't really focused our agro agronomic systems, we haven't focused our breeding on producing varieties that perform well in those scenarios. So I think there is a significant opportunity for genetic gain and to, to produce better material for organic production. So I, I don't write it off, I think it has an important role to play and I'd like to see more work done on uh, uh, you know, producing the appropriate systems for that type of farming. Excellent. I haven't got any more questions come up in my chat box, so if there's any teachers out there or anyone watching online who has a question, if you have a question for Peter, pop it in the text chat now. Otherwise, we might wrap it up in the next couple of minutes. There's one other question to ask you while we're running out. Well, I could... T I, I yeah, is there anything you wanted to add well before I we go? I'd be interested in hearing about... You know, I said that I was involved in this expert working group last year on uh, food security, uh, and uh, we came up with four recommendations, and I wondered whether there'd be interest in my just sort of going through those recommendations. I'll flick through my notes. Oh, we've had, had another question come yep. through from someone else. How do you think things like Roundup Ready crops will affect this issue? Do you want to maybe ref um, yeah, explain, explain that? Explain so, that? Round, so Roundup Ready, that's a technology that's been based around a, a herbicide, a very successful herbicide produced by the company Monsanto that has a very bad reputation in the community. Um, it was a, uh, when it came out, it was a very important herbicide because it has a very uh, rapid turnover in the, uh, in the soil, so it doesn't persist for a long time. Uh, and they, they uh, produce, they produced en genetically engineered plants that have resistance to that herbicide Roundup. Uh, and they're called Roundup Ready. Uh, now that technology is available in a number of crops now. In the US it's widely used in soybean and maize. Uh, in Australia we use it in cotton and also in canola. Uh, it, it has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the advantage is that it is, a, as I said, it's a, a fairly benign herbicide. Uh, and uh, prior to the use of uh, the Roundup Ready or the Roundup Resistant Canola in Australia, we were using conventionally bred canolas that were, were generated also to have herbicide tolerance. And they were resistant to atrazine and imidazolinone herbicides. Now these herbicides are, uh, uh, are turned over far more slowly in the environment. Uh, in fact, atrazine has been banned in Europe. Uh, so we were in the peculiar situation in Australia that we were using an, an inferior technology, which was essentially unregulated because it didn't involve genetic engineering, 
and we rejected probably, I think, what was the superior technology, which was a Roundup resistant. The key thing, though, is that the, the use of herbicide-tolerant crops does not reduce the amount of herbicide that's used generally in the, the farming system, but it may allow us to shift to more benign uh, herbicides. Um, and it's a trait that is important to the producer, but I don't think has a, a, a big impact upon the consumer. And we've got a couple more questions have come through. Um, we have a question about whether there are risks, any risks to changing plant genetics, um, particularly relating to the environmental impacts. Uh, yeah, I mean that's it's a good question, but Big it's question. A, uh, but it's a tricky one to answer. Um, you know, and I suppose it depends on what level we look at it. You know, we can look at a lot of things that have been done in agriculture around the world, and there are a lot of things that are have not been desirable. So there have been a lot of negative impacts from the directions we've gone in. Uh, a lot of that's been driven by the need to produce as much food as we possibly can from certain areas, and a lot of the problems we've had with monocultures and shifts and diseases have really come from that. Um, plant breeding by its very nature is a, a, you know, is a numbers game, and the breeders are making uh, crosses uh, and then screening the progeny to try and find desirable combinations of genes that will you know, meet whatever the requirements and scenarios are. They're very dependent upon the variation that's available within the, the gene pool, within the germplasm pool that they're working with. So remember, plant breeding is essentially based upon identifying useful variation, making the crosses, and then selecting out the individuals that have the desired traits, the desired phenotype that you're after. Uh, now, for some species, the germplasm pool is extremely narrow. Uh, for example, wheat, the species I work with, it's estimated that only less than 10% of the natural variation has been captured in commercial varieties. Um, crops like peanut, uh, there's almost no variation in peanut, uh, and it's a huge problem to manage the disease issues in that crop. So there are some significant problems related to specific crops due to the level of variation diversity they have. Uh, and you know, it really goes back that we've tended to, to breed for a particular scenario or particular outcome rather than considering the broader environmental issues, looking at how we manage uh, the entire farming system, in fact, how we manage the entire uh, landscape, and then designing or breeding or selecting our crops that will fit into that scenario. Uh, we haven't been able to do it in the past, but I think we can do it now. I hope and that answered the question. I'm sorry it was a fairly long-winded answer. We'll see if we get any more questions pop up here. We, we do have another one. Um, just going back briefly to the organic food, um, someone asks here, do you think organic food increases people's knowledge of food and where, where it comes from? Um, reflecting one of your points in needing to improve how we view food in society. I don't think organic food per se does that. And I think there's a lot of ignorance associated with organic food about what it is and what its advantages and disadvantages are. And as I said, I think one of the difficulties is that the organic movement has become, it's gone from being what, what it originally was, which was a scientific movement, to becoming more of an ideological movement, uh, which has, has meant that it's, uh, it's not being receptive to new ideas. I mean, for example, I think you know, genetic engineering is a perfect tool for organic production, uh, yet the organic movement has essentially rejected that for no valid scientific reason. Um, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry, I've actually forgotten what the original question was. Um, I think the point that they were uh, asking was, do you think um, organic food increases people's oh, okay. knowledge of food and where it comes from? So I guess yep. caring about how your food is made and where it comes from. Yeah, I think it's, you know, what would be, what I would like to see is people starting to grow their own food. You know, even if it's, you know, the matter of having a couple of tomato gr plants growing in a pot if you happen to live in a high-rise building. Um, I worked for four years in Germany, and uh, I lived in a small apartment, but I had quite a nice balcony. And in summer, I had the balcony completely planted with vegetables, and I had my own tomatoes and zucchinis and beans, and it was fantastic. So I think getting people interested in growing their own food and understanding what it involves to grow food, um, uh, you know, the diversity that you can, you can get, and, and let's face it, any food that you grow yourself always tastes better. It may be an illusion, but quite frankly, there's nothing better than homegrown food. And in Australia, pretty well everybody has a garden. So you can have a small vegetable patch, uh, you can have a couple of fruit trees, um, give it a go. It sounds like an ideal classroom project. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and another point here, um, a big issue is dealing with carbon. There is a push towards getting farmers to manage their soils to sequester carbon. How likely is this to impact on food security? Yeah, that's another very good question, another very difficult question. There is, uh, there is a balance, uh, a trade-off between clearly production and uh, the, you know, the greenhouse gas footprint of agriculture and carbon sequestration through you know, growing trees or simply having uh, plants with their roots in the soil is a, an important component of that. You know, ultimately, I'd like to see Australia move to a system where we had a, a, an accounting system that made allowances for all of those different components. You know, we're talking about a, um, uh, a price on carbon. Uh, we already have a price on water. Uh, we need prices on energy as well, and they need to be linked because there's always a trade-off between, the between the, those different components. Uh, it was interesting, while we were working on that food security project, there was another group working on, uh, expert working group looking at carbon, energy, and, wa um, and water. Uh, and one of their recommendations was to have a consistent pricing strategy across all of those things so that we can trade off one with the other. You know, so that if you build a desalinization plant, that has a big carbon cost and a big energy cost. So how do you do that trade off uh, between having a desalinization plant and looking at other ways of water harvesting? When you go to farms, how do you do a trade-off between carbon sequestration and agricultural reduction? How do you trade off planting trees with the cost of water that may go with that? So all of these things, and there needs to be, I think, a consistent basis so that we're not um, essentially trying to develop these artificial economies and think that we're dealing with a problem where in actual fact we may actually be making it worse. Um, we have another question here. The notion of homegrown food was a 1960s and 70s feature in Australia, um, but it's dropped away. How can we regenerate this, as you mentioned with your own example in Germany? Um, I think there are, there are actually quite a lot of options. There are lots of programs already going on in Australia to try and encourage people to grow their own fruit and vegetables. Uh, it was quite interesting. I discovered recently at the, uh, the peak of the drought uh, in Canberra, when they're under water restrictions, the, the local government offered courses in how to grow your own fruit and vegetables and how to use water more effectively and so on. They were oversubscribed. They couldn't meet the demand. So I think they're quite simple things we can do. Offer people uh, uh, training advice on these sorts of things. Uh, give them free fruit trees, for heaven's sake, or free seedlings to, uh, to grow in the garden. It's not very expensive. Uh, there is a lot that can be done. There are a number of cities that have, have really taken this on board. Uh, in recent times, so I was reading about Vancouver, where apparently something like 20% of the fruit and vegetables consumed in Vancouver are grown in home gardens. And that's in a climate where they have a winter, quite a hard winter, um, in Havana in Cuba. And admittedly, there are other constraints that have been operating in Cuba. They produce over half of the, uh, the food that's consumed in the city of Havana is grown within the city limits. So there are things you can do. Uh, there are incentives you can give people. There are ways in which you can help them, uh, you know, get set up. For many people who've never grown a fruit tree or, or uh, uh, vegetables, it can be a little bit intimidating to think about how you might do this. So can we help them? Um, school gardens, community gardens, all of these sorts of things can all be supported. And they are in many communities in Australia already. Um, so I think we've got through all the questions now. So I might just ask in conclusion, if you wanted to talk through some of the recommendations that your working group um, yep. recommended as part of the report on food security for Australia. Some of these recommendations we've actually already covered in the question and answers here. So uh, our, our first recommendation was that the government should really consider setting up a national food security agency to try and coordinate activities. Food is so important in our society that almost every government department has some role in food. I was quite surprised to discover, I'm sorry I'm digressing again, to discover that the Department of Defense has a big group looking at food and food security. You know, how would, how would we deal with an emergency in Australia and how do you feel, feel, sorry, feed a large army uh, in some remote location? So food's important there, it's in food, important in so many aspects of, of our life that many government departments have responsibility for some aspect. At the federal level, at the state level and even at the regional level. There are big issues about land management. Uh, there's, a, uh, I think, a big issue about articulating Australia's attitude towards food. You know, we're not the only country in the world that are worried about this. Um, the, uh, uh, the G20 uh, summit that's going to be held in Paris, uh, I think, in a few weeks' time, 
uh, one of the top items on the agenda put on there by the French government is food security. The World Bank have also said that food security is the biggest issue facing the world at the moment. So lots of countries are, uh, are looking at this issue and problem, and I think we need an agency that articulates Australia's role. What role can we play and how can we help? So that was the first one, some sort of coordinating agency. The second recommendation was, in Australia, we've developed great skills and strength in production in uh, low input systems. Uh, you know, we've been forced to do that because we have essentially an unsubsidized uh, agricultural system. And even though I think many people have a feeling that farmers are always in, you know, just lurching from one disaster to, to the next, in actual fact, agriculture has been our most productive industry. Uh, the efficiency gains that have been achieved by our farmers uh, has been spectacular. As the only industry that has, uh, has beaten them has been the IT industry, and that's clearly for other reasons. So agriculture has been very sophisticated, so can we build on that strength and can we develop collaborations around that area? The third area, uh, third recommendation was about training. We desperately need more people in pretty well all aspects of uh, food science and agricultural production. We really struggle to get students interested in agriculture. I think, again, you know, we have a highly urbanised population. I think they, they somehow have a feeling that agriculture is primitive. They don't realise it's probably one of our most sophisticated areas of uh, activity. In fact, uh, there was a recent uh, analysis of, you know, the science done in different areas in Australia and how we compare internationally. Agricultural science came up number one. So you hear about medical research, but in reality, internationally, we are, uh, um, we are best known for agricultural research. So, come on, uh, study agriculture. And the third is really related to this whole community issue. How do we stimulate interest in the community? How do we get them more interested in food, making better decisions about food, uh, and ultimately sending signals back down to the food chain? See, part of the problem is that we have a, this huge food industry, and they produce the food that the consumers are asking for and demanding. The consumers are asking for junk food, they produce junk food. So we need the consumers to basically say, hang on, we actually do like fresh tomatoes. We actually do like to have our drinks without a huge amount of sugar in them. You know, so we need to get those signals going back down through the food chain. And we need to do that by getting a community that's interested in food, understands food, and understands the problems that you're going to have if you eat bad food. Okay, that's, I think, <laughs> if there's anything else you'd like to add before we go, we might wrap it up now. Was there anything else you wanted to add? No, I think I've probably said enough. <laughs> okay, well, I'll just... Um, I'll just go back up here. All right, so thank you very much, Peter, for being with us today and sharing that with us. And I hope that people were able to ask their questions and have them answered. Uh, we will be making this video available online as a resource that you're free to use in the classroom. Um, so just go to our website to find that, where you'll also find the supporting teacher notes. Um, but I'd just like to once again thank Peter Langridge from the Australian Centre for Plant Functional Genomics for joining us for the first session of RIOS PD+.